Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, here we are today uh, with uh, Lisa Marqua Harris, uh, who has flown all the way from South Africa, not just for this interview, but uh, has uh, kindly agreed to, to to spend some time with me and talk to you about uh, what's going on over there and her work. Uh, we're in London. It's very sunny, as you can see <laughs> outside. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a bit of a basement room, but that's fine, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, so Lisa, thank you so much for uh, uh, taking time off to to to, to see me. Um, I was wanting to ask you a bit about your background first, because uh, you have an interesting background. Uh, your family is from Germany, you say? My father was from Germany, but we, we grew up in South Africa. Um, was born there and grew up there. Yeah. Okay, and and you. You work, you're one of the directors, yes. uh, together with uh, Lindsay uh, of uh, Restore. Yes. Uh, if you want to visit the website, it'll be on the comments box, uh, but it's restore.org.za uh, for South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about the organization, how it was born and uh, what aims it has? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've been working in prisons for around... 11 years now, um, actually starting off with um, a ministry called Hope Prison Ministry that was based there and have been there for many years. And, and we originally started by working with young children in prison, so under 18. And when I started in 2005, the Child Justice Act had not been passed yet. Uh, it, it, it took about eight years um, for, for this bill to be passed and so there were many children in prison and awaiting trial and so we began working uh, with these young children um, initially just learning life skill programs um, but in 2006 I got exposed to restorative justice process and a victim awareness process um, and so we began to um, work with young young people, um, sort of running running courses uh, around that, and things kind of developed and evolved from there. So mm -hmm. so sort of from going in um, and 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 seeing a process work, mm -hmm. um, well, and in fact I I myself personally went through a a process within my family, a very similar sort of dialogue process, which I found very helpful. And so that also um, inspired me, you know, in, in mm -hmm. the work to, to sort of pursue this. And, um, you, know, you know what's interesting? Um, all the people, all the organizations that work with um, uh, prisons uh, have also uh, been through a phase, an initial phase perhaps, when they were providing uh, life skills. But then they realized that uh, restorative justice can help people uh, acquire all their people uh, that have been incarcerated get uh, other life skills as well that they will need uh, once they leave uh, prison yes, yes. and 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 that's sort of uh, what motivated them to to move is is that sort of thing that uh, you would be doing in prisons with uh, young kids yes. equip them with uh, social skills that will allow them to integrate into society that's a part of it definitely i mean i think what we found was particularly in south africa um working um, now, now we work with the slightly older juveniles, so 18 to 21, although we still see the younger ones um, uh, once a week. Um, but what we found was many of these young people coming from their communities are coming from communities with what we call continuous trauma. <clears throat> and it's, it's more than post-traumatic stress disorder. It's, it's beyond that. They... Um, they are exposed to high levels of violence growing up, um, you know, all the time. It's in the communities. It becomes the norm for them. And, and that also means that they are um, living in a sort of a heightened state of awareness or high alert. Um, and so we, what we found, and we've had to adapt our program, and we're still adapting it, and we're continuously just learning, is, is, is actually to... Um, you, you know, even before you start teaching the, the 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 great sort of skills and tools that these young people need, you need to create an environment where they can begin to feel safe, but um, 
also come out of that sort of um, yeah like war mentality you were mentioning <laughs> before. It's like uh, they they're they're war at yeah. a personal level if you like. Yeah, that gang. There's a lot of gang warfare that goes on. We have um, there's a, around a hundred and forty thousand gangsters in the Western Cape where I live. And um, that's more than the police and the military. The, our police and military put together are around 40,000 to 140,000 young people in gangs. And um, and so, and actually I have a great book. I don't know if I should mention yes, it. Yes, you should mention but, it. You um, should mention it. Um, it's a good time. But. Uh, uh, Gang Town by Don Pinnock. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about this book? Uh, I mean, uh, you said that this was one of your boys. Can you explain to me what that is? Yeah, well, actually, this this book's just been published a few months ago, and you can get it on Kindle. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd, I'd highly recommend it because it, it looks at, I mean, it is sort of focused around Cape Town and South Africa, but it does look at his, the history of gangs, but then also what is a gang. But then it goes further into looking at um, the struggle with families, toxic neighborhoods, um, towards resilience and then actually providing some tools for people working with young people in in sort of violent um, communities. So it's a brilliant book. I haven't finished reading it, so I won't, <laughs> won't give it away. But it's um, I, I would highly recommend it just in, in the sense of beginning to understand. We need to understand our youth and young people um, before we... You know, we, we can come with some great programs and some great concepts and principles, and, and I really believe restorative justice can offer uh, some am amazing pathways to dialogue. Um, but we actually need to understand where these young men are coming from first before we begin to engage with that. And that's something so, know the why first, know the why, yes. why people uh, engage in this sort of activity. Yeah. Uh, I'm, we were talking about this before, uh, before starting recording, and it was interesting because uh, uh, gang uh, crime, uh, gang guns, is, uh, are not only an issue in South Africa. Uh, uh, they're very much they have been in the news here in London as well for mm -hmm. quite some time. A bit less these days because uh, of the uh, more pressing uh, news. But mm -hmm. uh, there, there, there was not that long ago a very huge uh, uproar with uh, gun crime and kids. Uh, wielding knives and, and things like that. There have yeah. been uh, issues with gangs of youngsters in other places. In in big cities in Spain, that may have been a problem uh, in the past. I know that it has been in France as well, in other places. Yeah. And uh, I think that this, uh, again, I'll put it, uh, it'll be on, on the comments. Gang Town yeah. uh, will be an interesting read. I might get it myself, to be okay. honest. Uh, you know, well, you let, let me know what you think. <laughs> and I mean, uh, just another point, really, um, around that is we, we, as part of our program, of course, that we run in prison, mm -hmm. we, um, we, we feel very strongly that before we, we look at the damage and the impact of crime and how to take responsibility, which is important, um, uh, we we do acknowledge and have some time with these young men looking at their own victimization, and um, and out of one class, I've got a, a poster here. But out of one class, we had fourteen young men, and there were over six hundred and sixty-seven accounts of their own victimization of things that had happened to them growing up. And so, in one room, we were sitting in this in this circle. And it was it was so powerful because here we had, you know, acknowledged together as a, as a small community in this room, um, the pain and the trauma um, that that probably has never really been spoken about, never addressed, never acknowledged. And and yes, one could probably do you know weeks or months of of unpacking that with them, and we don't have a lot of time. But I I, I feel even just those sessions acknowledging that and. And, and spending time almost standing in the gap on behalf of society to say, um, we are sorry this this has happened to you, it, it's probably one of the most powerful sessions. So let, let me get this. Um, you have uh, offenders, 
yes. criminals in a room. Mm. And uh, what you do is uh, you go through instances where they have been themselves victims. Mm. This is something interesting because it has been mentioned in other interviews as well. And obviously, you know about it. Um, a lot of the time, uh, because of the environment, I suppose, uh, because of the, the places where they live or where they yeah. move, uh, that's their daily lives. Yes. So they, they uh, cause aggression on others, but they also receive aggression from others. And uh, yeah. it becomes normalized. Yes. So to the extent that some people just don't see what's wrong with that, yeah. you know, that's, that's daily life, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I suppose this is, in a way, this is a way of showing them, you know, you didn't like what happened to you, it happened to you, we acknowledge it. Yes. Now you have to acknowledge that uh, what you do to other people is not right and they may not like it either. Yeah, exactly. But it, it needs, I really feel it needs to start there and for, for many of these young people. And, um, and, and also, I mean, something, you know, restorative justice or victim awareness programs is being obviously even research done. I know Prison Fellowship has done research um, with the Crime Fix to um, data, looking at how it, it does awaken empathy. But something that trauma and continuous trauma does is shuts down empathy. So, um, you know, there's this, you, you're coming with young men that, that are, um, again, on, on high alert, empathy is shut down. Um, As a word protection, I suppose. Yes, yes. So then, how, you know, how do we engage these 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 very sensitive topics but yeah we, we we had one young man i can just share a story on from our program we had one young man he was sitting in the circle and he he said to us i don't like your program <laughs> so i was like okay tell me more i mean that doesn't bother me you know tell, tell me more and he said um i i'm feeling guilty so I was like, okay, so you he was in prison for a year and a half when, when we met him. He'd already been there for a year and a half. Now he's feeling guilty. So he says, um, I have 21 victims in my case. And he had set a tear gas canister off in the school stadium. And, um, and people were injured. They panicked, you know, they ran out and people were hurt. And he said, I've never once thought about my victims. I've been sitting here for a year and a half in prison and I've never once thought about my victims. And now you're telling me there's more I must do. And of course, we weren't telling him that, but it was just coming out from well, this Well, he must have process. got to that point himself. Uh, like you said, you yeah. know, in one of those sessions, you don't tell them you're guilty of this. It's, no. it's you, you, you put the facts in front of them. And yeah. And so, um, so you know, he, he got to this revelation. And often we say these young guys get a light bulb moment where they, you know, they, something goes on through, through learning together, through active learning. We, we're not there to tell them. We're not there to teach them. But we learn together in a group and we begin to share. We share community. We share um, each other's pain. And, and actually, ultimately, I think it's about equipping these young men um, around storytelling and beginning to learn how to i think right at the the bottom of of you know the crux of what we do in mm -hmm. you know yes it's an it's a victim awareness program but ultimately i feel right at the crux is how do we tell it how do we begin to tell our stories and if we mm -hmm. don't even have a voice or a narrative and even know what that is how can we begin to even consider maybe meeting you know our victim or you know maybe a, a surrogate victim or maybe even our family when we come up because they they may be the very person we've hurt as well and so but we don't have a dialogue and we don't we don't know how and so I feel you know in prison we have this opportunity to begin to equip these young men um, yes we run through you know what is crime and the impact of crime and the ripple effects, and we cover all of that, but ultimately we're trying to equip them to, to be able to own a narrative and understand that. And for many of them, they don't even know, you know, they, 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 they've never been heard. And so even just sitting in a circle and you now have a voice, you know, is, is the start. I mean... It's a way as well to let their guard down and, and be able to listen to others, because they have never been listened to, but they probably never listened to other people either. Uh, so it's a way to to uh, 
peel the the, the, the layers off and, and, yes. and let uh, the light get in. Uh, you know what's interesting? Um, you, you're talking about uh, how uh, these people who are already, these young guys who are already in prison, are getting the benefit of this treatment. And I, I can't help but think that uh, wouldn't it be better even if all the people that are not yet in prison, mm-hmm. have not yet committed a crime perhaps, but are in that sort of environment, mm-hmm. had access to this sort of thing as well, this sort of program. Uh, but obviously you need to have uh, trigger points, and the trigger point at the moment is to be in prison. Mm-hmm. So you need to have been uh, a court uh, delinquent mm-hmm. to have access to this. Yeah. You need to have done... Uh, you need to you need to be in prison, in fact, to have access to this. Mm. And that's a bit of a shame, isn't it? It, it yeah. looks like a missed opportunity. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are some some work starting up in schools. Um, in fact, Don Pinnock, who writes the book Gang Town, um, he, you know, looking at gang prevention. I remember going to a seminar with him many years, many a few years ago, um, at. Uh, the University of Cape Town, and and it struck me when he said gang prevention, um, start working with young pregnant teenage girls because already in the womb, um, the you know hormone through hormone hormonally and I mean I, I'm sure he covered it in his book. So if you want to read more about stress, that, I guess it's a stress situation that uh, but they, they're already being prone to violence. So many many young people, you know, may be born with a gun and a knife in their hand. Because, you know, so the womb is an environment too. You know, we think, well, toxic neighborhoods and what's going on in our communities, you know. And, but he covers that in his book. So I feel like that's a really fascinating, you know, we're working with these young men at, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20. And, you know, yes, we need to, you know, it needs to be... Well, Prevention needs to take place much, much earlier. Yes. But I still, like, uh, these young men need something to <laughs> until that prevention starts working down there but yeah i mean there's many areas one could be involved in and i just happen to end up in prison and <laughs> <laughs> through no fault of your own <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay that's interesting we were talking before about some um statistics some uh, background information about uh, south africa mm. i mean uh I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people know about uh, Aberhoop, uh but the, I mean, they might know a bit about it. They don't know really what it is like uh, to live in a segregated community like that. Would you like to give some information, some background mm. uh, as to what it is like to be there, to be uh, to to be raised uh, there, uh, to be born in 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 either community mm. and the conflicts it creates? Mm. Well, what's what's fascinating now actually is um, I've been very privileged and honoured to be part of a. A research project which is sort of the first um, project looking at historical trauma in South Africa you know there's been a lot that's been written around the Holocaust and, and other events but you know and, and then you know we had apartheid and so it's been a real privilege actually as as a young woman who was born there um, and then you know um, growing up there but then spending time abroad and then coming back and working in the prisons to then now be, um, you know, part of this research team, which was with the International Justice and Reconciliation Institute, as well as um, Professor Pumla, I must get the name right, Gaberda Madibuzela, um, and she's been pioneering and piloting re- this research, um, going into communities and looking at intergenerational trauma and the impact of that. So, but there's still um, the the you know, I think especially around geographical um, segregation, people that, you know, were displaced, there's, you know, there's still very much, there's this displacement Mm -hmm. of of communities that I I feel has an impact, um, you know, on our country amongst many other things. And um, so, so, yeah, I don't know if I'm, I'm answering the question clearly, but just... Um, yes, yes, you are. I, I tell you what, you know, um, I just remember that a few weeks ago, or perhaps even a few days ago, the Guardian newspaper uh, published a, a series of photographs uh, uh, from the air, maybe from the satellite, that showed, you know, the geographical lines of um, segregation in South Africa, mm, where mm. you have uh, the areas with nice houses and gardens, and then mm. right next to it... Uh, uh, there are there's a shanty town with uh, all the 
tin rooftops and things yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite clear how how many years since uh, since um, apartheid was abolished, uh, yeah. and uh, this, that's still there. I mean, yeah. it, it's not perhaps a, an overt policy, no. but circumstances and the evolution of society and the economy, I suppose, and opportunities mm. have meant that uh, perhaps yeah. that hasn't changed that much. Yeah. I mean, some of the stats, I was recently at a, I was at the European Forum for Restorative Justice and, and did a short paper there, and so I was obviously looking at stats. That was last week, right? Yes, yes, it was really good, I loved it, I had so much fun. Um, <laughs> it was the first time I went, but it was great. Um, well, you could have been there. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't go there, and I couldn't go to Skopelos in, uh, in Greece either. Oh, uh, no. I'm, I'm crying shame, because uh, those two things, those two things, uh, uh, I, I get people now telling me, you know, it was fantastic. Yeah. It was the spirit, the atmosphere, the act, mingling with the people who yeah. are uh, like-minded in a way, but also, you know, who are prepared to challenge you and who want to learn. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was, it was great. It was next amazing. year, next year, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but some of the stats, you know, looking at South Africa, um, I've, I've got, uh, I sort of wrote a few stats out, and so, for example, a murder statistics taken. Um, from in, uh, intentional homicide um, in South Africa, it's thirty-three to a hundred thousand, um, whereas somewhere like the UK, it'll be one to a hundred thousand. So, uh, as well as unemployment stats taken from the World Bank, we're, we're around fifty-three percent unemployment. So there, there's many. Challenges. I imagine higher even for younger people. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely higher for younger people. I'm not sure on those stats, but. Um, you know, yeah, the, many of the young people in the Western Cape are, um, you know, the gangs are made up of, of youth, of young people. So we come into the why, why people get into gangs, for example. Uh, one thing is that uh, that's what they see around them. So mm -hmm. gangs already exist and uh, that's what becomes normal. Uh, uh, that's what you see every day. And the other thing is that lack of, lack of opportunity. Uh, so I suppose that inequality which is a big issue and I think it's connected to to, to crime uh, it is connected to there are very strong links uh, I'm not an expert so I'm not mm, going to say no, no, well no. you know there's a direct link here yeah, and there yeah, yeah. but there are strong links yeah. between uh, uh, criminality and uh, inequality be partly because uh, I'm not going to say that this is what it is but partly I suppose because uh, some people who are worse off think that they if they don't get what they deserve in society, they can just go and grab it, mm. uh, or they should. That's that they they're pushed to do that in a way. Yeah, and I think just lack of positive role, you know, mentors and role models, and um, sort of lack of father figures um, is a strong, strong sort of high statistic as well. So you don't have a strong family unit that uh, uh, gives uh, uh, morals. Uh, that it takes behavior to, to an extent mm. that uh, sets rules. Mm. In fact, some of our young guys say, um, <clears throat> we look at what one of our, in one of our courses, we look at what can harm you on the outside, or what can kill you on the outside, but then we look at what can kill you on the inside. And um, it's fascinating when they give us, we, we get them to list down, um, they actually draw this big human body on as, as if someone sort of, you know, like, if it was a forensic scene and someone, you know, and we draw around, it's very, we love being creative. And um, and then it's interesting what they come up with what can kill you on the outside. I mean, that's easy for them. Oh, like uh, a brick or, a, you know, a stick a or a punga <laughs> or, you know, um, or even I, I have one of these car mechanisms that lock your wheel, um, your steering wheel oh, yeah? for safety. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, you can kill someone with that. You know, I'm thinking, <laughs> where are you coming up with all this? But it's what they've seen, you know. And then, but we look at what can kill you on the inside, and and an event, you know, and of course we can look at health issues, you know, and stay, you know, and then they say stress and and anger even, but then they say words. Well, we unpack words, and many of them say what what kills them on the inside is if someone says to them, "You're just like your father," because for many of them, their fathers are in either have been in prison or they've never known their father, or they have a stepdad who kick them out or so that those words are just like your father and and we begin to unpack that with them but you know just yeah just that's that's quite 
uh, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's surprising, but it's quite strange because if you're born in a into to a good family and uh, you're happy, someone telling you you're just like, you're like your father, mm. you wouldn't think that as a negative. Mm. However, in this setting, in this environment, mm. uh, yeah. that is a very negative thing to say to yeah. someone. Yeah, for them, you know, it it as they say, it kills you on the inside, and so we we we. Yeah, and we also sort of body map where they carry their anger and their stress, and they also get to draw all the scars and the bullet wounds that they've had on their body. So eventually this body map looks, it's full of scars and color, and it's fascinating where they draw, where they carry their anger and stress, and um, often in their fists, it's all colored in for their anger. And, mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, we, ha we, we, we learn a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it, this is the video that uh, uh, has been produced as part of this project, right? Yes. Uh, so it's called Black Christmas, um, where forgiveness is not in the saying, it's in the doing. Uh, it's produced by Puma, uh, Pumla mm -hmm. Gobodo. Uh, Madikizela. I'm not going to say it right. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark Kaplan. Okay, and, and this uh, charts the, uh, the story of... Uh, can, can you tell us about this uh, DVD? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I wasn't directly involved with this, but I, I did work with Pumla on the research project, and um, I'd highly recommend this. It, it's a story of a young man who um, was sort of extreme right-wing influence, and he <coughs> set, racially set off a bomb as a racial attack in 1996, um, him and three others on Christmas Eve in a mixed-race shopping mall. And um, four people were killed and <clears throat> 70 people were injured. And then he, he gave himself, and I won't tell you the whole story, you can watch it, but, but it follows, he, he actually um, do, does a victim offender dialogue and, and the survivors, uh, a few survivors go up to meet him in prison. And it, it's just really powerful. Um, well, actually, this this one survivor wanted to know what had happened to him and who he was, and it just started her own journey of healing. And um, so she she approached a victim support group in her area, and mm -hmm. they and they're not many, so you know it's amazing how this has happened. And um, and this journey began, and so she meets him in prison, and 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 he ends up then being taken to the community where the bomb happened to meet other people. And there's mixed reactions, but it's very real and it's very raw. And um, it, I feel it's an amazing tool to to wrestle with um, some of these these things that happen in in society. And it does look at the deep dimensions of forgiveness, but the complexities as well. And so it's a great tool, I think, for any country, any community. I think all the more complex because it's not a one-on-one -on -one crime. It's a, 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 a group on a, on another group. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't want to use the, the word terrorism, but that would seem something that uh, you know a lot of people could be interested in at the moment. Yeah. When we're uh, wrestling with uh, situations where you have people, you know, uh, doing terrorist attacks, you know, what can be done about yeah. it? Yeah. Is is that uh, something that could be uh, 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 fixed? Well, not fixed, but uh, mm -hmm. could resort to justice be used in that context? And apparently, yeah. Well, some would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think I think this is a great tool to get people talking because I'm not. It, it may not have all those answers, but it, it can definitely get discussions going, and and they would love feedback as well. Um, so we can put the email address. I think it's it's so new uh, that they you know they still must get the website up for it. To, you know, you can buy it, but um, but I'm sure if if you contact them by email or contact me and I can forward information on it, it's well worth. Okay, well, I'll do so. Uh, uh, when I put my comments, I'll put uh, the contact email here uh, and I'll put yours as well if you yeah. don't mind. And then, if you're interested, I and why shouldn't you be to be honest? <laughs> uh, you can get in touch directly with them and get yourself a copy. Yeah. Okay, so that's very interesting. I was going to ask you before because uh, you were talking about uh, having circles of young uh, people and talking about cancer and stuff like that. Does it not occur that you have in the same circle, in the same room, people from opposing uh, gangs, uh, gangs and mm -hmm. who may have been uh, enemies, and now you have them in the same room and having to cooperate there instead? Yeah. Well, even within the... It, we, we do find that, and we... I mean, even within the prison gang, because 
uh, in South Africa, there's um, Ross Kemp many years ago did a documentary on prisons. Um, Paul's more featured uh, in that documentary. And there's, there's a prison gang called The Number. Uh, and also many years ago, um, I'm not sure if it happens so much now. Again, if you read that book, Gangtown, you'll find more about it. But, um, you know, people used to commit crime in order to go to prison because the only way you could climb rank in the number gang was in prison. It was a, it was a pure prison gang. Mm-hmm. And you couldn't be a member on the outside. Now it has changed. There's, there's a lot oh, more. Oh, they, they've opened that. <laughs> they've <membership>. opened up. <laughs> <laughs> That's great news. Yeah, well, <laughs> but I don't know. But, but, but so you might have a, you know, you had the 26s, 27s, 28s. So sitting in your class in a circle, you could have a 26 and a 28 or, um, you know, and, and they are opposing gangs. And so... Um, not that they would fight each other. It was it, it, it's a complex system of discipline and um, how they function. alliances, I suppose, uh, yeah. to get them through through that period. But then, yeah, they might sit next to each other, and we we, we we often do this thing of saying an encouraging word about your friend next to you, or introduce your friend. You know, you've got to find out five five things you didn't know about them, and then you introduce them. And so here they are. You know, and the one guy will go, this is my friend, you know, you know. And so I, I guess in that context, um, it, it is unpacking. It is, it is curious. I'm going to say two things about this. First thing is it's a bit depressing to think that uh, someone could feel that their life is so devoid of opportunity that they think that a good course, a good option is to go to prison to join a gang. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that's a bit of a depressing thought. A positive one, I suppose, for me would be to think that, uh, you know, people, uh, I'm not going to say this gang or that gang, people in general can relate to each other. You know, no matter, no matter how uh, angry they may be at each other, how different, how mm. uh, offended by each other they, they think they might be, mm. uh, they might consider each other enemies, but you put them in a room yeah. and you, through restorative justice, uh, through restorative approaches in general, you know, mm those people end up talking to each other and perhaps even having a laugh at some point. Yeah. And that's that's very powerful, yeah. uh, you know, because these are still humans and that shows. Yeah. We had one young guy, uh, I love stories, so I'm just going to throw in a story. Um, he, after doing our course or during our course, he began to feel challenged to think differently. And he was a gang member, but also you have non-gang members mixed in, in the rooms as well and in the program. And generally, they don't mix. There's more of a, like, they call them Franca. Um, and and he went back to his room. And what happens is um, they they get lunch and dinner at the same time. So they will eat at around, you know, 12, half past 12, because there's not enough staff on duty to do a main a meal at night. So you will get bread to take back with you that you can eat later if you want or eat then or uh, actually food's a big currency in prison and um and he decided to share his bread with a non-gang member because he said i began seeing everyone as equal and so just you know he came back to class and shared that you know the following week that you know it might seem like a simple thing oh he's sharing his bread but that's a huge thing in prison when bread is currency and you don't you don't associate with a non-gang member because they're not your class or rank or whatever. Well, I suppose that you're a member of a gang because you want to be separated from the rest who are not. Yeah. So that, that, do you, know, do you know what I think about that when I hear that? I think how toxic must be the life of these young men when, you know, that simple gesture mm-hmm. is so significant. Yeah. Yeah, you know, how harsh uh, must mm-hmm. be their environment, their mm-hmm. day-to-day lives. Yeah. When uh, just sharing some bread, uh, which uh, you know some people here would do without uh, thinking about it, mm-hmm. you know, is such a significant event. Yeah. We had one young man. This was years ago, though. Who got it? He shared his story. He was 16 in prison when I met him. He's one of the younger ones, and and he said, "I got into a fight at school." And I mean, it's amazing. Some many of them got out of school, but he was still at school, obviously younger, then, around nine, I think. And he said, um, my dad was a gang, top gangster in the community where I grew up, and I got beaten up, and I came home, and my dad was so mad at me. 
Now you'd think most dads would be mad because you got into a fight at school, but he said, my dad was mad because I lost the fight and he gave me a gun and a knife and said, this is how you sort your problems out. Don't ever come home looking like you do. And so for him, in order to what a role him, model. <laughs> to, in order to win his father's affection, and when I met him, his dad was in prison, his brother was in prison, he was in prison. And, and here was, you know, the generation. And so, you know, these are the stories, many of them come out. One young man was sent out by his dad and uncle to go buy them drugs. He just happened to stop on the corner and smoke some of the drugs with his friends, so he got picked up and thrown into prison. But why, why is the parents sending... You know these young men out to you know to go and pick up the drugs for them and do the what what role model is that you know so there's many um there's a lot of a lot of anger as well we had one young man um stab and kill someone stab someone seven times over a cap they were fighting over over a cap that you know there was drugs involved and obviously so that you know it also changes the, the situation quite drastically. But there's a lot of anger and violence, and uh, and they become normalized. Yeah. And, and I suppose to an extent, uh, when when the alternative, you know, is so unappealing as well, you know, when the, when everyone is doing it to you, and I suppose in that sort of environment, you're either uh, a strong member, a strong person, or you're a victim. Mm-hmm. And very often, you're both. Mm. Uh, you need to, you have the all the encouragement to be the more aggressive one. Mm. So that's interesting. What yeah. what I was thinking is, <clears throat> people that go through this program, uh, eventually they're released from prison as well, mm. and they go back to their communities. Yeah. Do you have any any experience? Do you have any information about what happens with them? Yeah, that's. An interesting question. This is an area we are trying to strengthen. Um, currently, there's just three women working in prison, in this um, prison of uh, 9,000 prisoners, and the prison was built for 4,600, so it's around 200% overcrowded. And we work with the younger uh, men that are in their sort of own section. Um, so there are three of us on the ground. Um, and, and there's a few others that do come in and help us. Uh, I've got a great friend who's got a psychology background and he's really helped adapt our program to context, um, Grant. But um, so, so what we've been looking at is partnering. And we do a lot of partnerships because, you know, partnering with others. Necro, for example, work with oh, yeah. uh, with um, offender re- reintegration and we've got some a great friend that works there. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've worked with them of some young guys that have a non-custodial sentencing, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, trying to place some guys in some programs on the outside. Um, but we also now are looking at a, a peer mentorship, partnering with a peer mentorship program called Coach. Um, and it's a new thing that we're, we're wanting to, to, you know, partner with them to pilot where we can possibly connect coaches with these young guys while they're still in, you know, knowing where mm. they will go out to and then, uh, you know, have a coach from their community that can can build a link. It, it is very challenging because the communities where they're coming from where there's all these challenges are, are still there and, they're, and we're sending them back. We're, we're in contact with, or we have been in contact with, you know, a good 20 of our young men and and we say to them you need to contact us when you come out because we know we, we know they're serious then because I mean if they can find 10 rand to get a hit of drugs they can find 10 rand to make a phone call to one of us and so um, we, we do we do get them contacting us and whatsapping us they get loads of whatsapps um, but um, but it is a challenge and they do fall through the cracks and um, you know, we we've got a a good three to four years um, currently of of information and data that we you know could be tracking now mm-hmm. to find out. Um, we do see a few come back, uh, mostly not though. But yeah, where are they? And um, so yeah, that that is an area. The reintegration is an, is a struggle, and many of them go out on parole, mm-hmm. and then they they're limited and restricted to what they can do for you know a certain amount in a day 
this, the, you know, so they, they sit at home, possibly get bored, mix up with the wrong friends, girls broken, you know, so there's a cycle. Mm. So so if I'm if I'm honest, if I you know, if, if something that's really impacted and influenced us um, is uh, the work of um, Professor James Garbarino. I don't know if you've heard of him. I have not. He's based at Loyola University in Chicago, and we've spent some time there, and he's also spent a fair bit of time in South Africa um, and many other nations. And many years ago, he wrote a book called Lost Boys, Why Are Young Men um, Turn Violent and How We Can Save Them. And, and this piece, there's particularly a chapter, uh, I think it's chapter eight, right towards the end of the book, where he actually speaks about um, he, he calls it from boot camp to monastery. And he speaks about a monastic prison model. And, and, he's, and, and, and he says, well, you know, cause, because prison is ultimately around, um, you know, we call it rehabilitation centers now. But, you know, it's about you know, punishment. It's around safety and security. Um, that's, that is the warden's first call of duty. They can't mm -hmm. be there to really rehabilitate when they're called for safety and security. So then they rely on outside NGOs to come in and assist. But your environment is still one. I mean, if you think about Bob Toes, uh, Barbara Toes, who, who speaks around, I love it, like she, she's done, I think, her PhD in looking at restorative spaces, working with prisoners to say, what is a restorative space? Never mind this dialogue that needs to happen, what is our space like? Prisons are built so that, you know, like not enough light comes in. Obviously, they're built so you can't escape. So, I mean, you're, you know... Well, they, they are punitive. So, the privation yeah. of freedom, but also the, 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 you put in a setting that is not comfortable. Um, and I suppose, in a way, you know, uh, society wouldn't understand, because I have heard this before, you know, uh, you commit a crime and you're sent to a hotel. Well, it's not a hotel, and you don't get free food. It is mm. prison, isn't mm. it? <laughs> yeah, and and well, definitely not with two hundred percent overcrowding. There isn't a hotel happening where <laughs> we are. But um, <laughs> but but you know, so yeah, that, that's a struggle because I mean, it, yes, you know, there's this thing of crime and punishment and rehabilitation. But how do you then rehabilitate or try to restore someone back to their community? Otherwise, that cycle is going to continue, yeah. right? Um, but but what James very much brings to light in his book, and I'd highly recommend it as well, um, Lost Boys, and he's actually published a recent book called Listening to Killers, and that covers his 30, 40 years experience of working with people on death row, and you know, all of, it's fascinating. Um, but, you know, he says, you know, the environment needs to be conducive to, to change and um, bringing things like music, classical music, bringing things, these are important things to have in, 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 in your programs or in, a, in an environment. Ultimately, I would love to see a wing of the prison that, that, that looks like a restorative space and, and where there's a safe env environment where these young men can begin to engage with some of these topics so that they don't reoffend and they don't you know, they say South Africa is 80 to 90 percent reoffending. I suppose that it's it, you're talking about an environment where they can see what it feels like not to be on a heightened state of yes. alert all the time. Yes, exactly. You know? And so we have our space, and we've actually, we were told if, uh, last year we had someone come and visit us from Boston who runs, um, has set up halfway houses, written books about working with youth at risk. And, and we said, give us one word of your experience of spending a morning with us. And the word he gave us was sanctuary. That was his experience. He experienced a sanctuary in the space that we created with these young men. But we know he's sending them back to, you know, we're with them for two or three hours, and the rest of the time they're back in the gang, in, in the room, back with limited staff to, to, you know, to even be on hand or on call. So don't... It is a struggle with... Uh, yeah, you're doing some work during some hours and then that work has been undone yeah. the rest of the time. Yes, we still really believe it's important to be there, but we have these tensions. And, and that's why I feel strongly that we need, we need to um, encourage, especially with young people, and I'm, I know 
adults are great too, but I feel strongly for young people. Even there's a greater opportunity with younger people. That we, we begin to create these environments where, where, yes, they can engage with the damage of crime, and that's so important, but but not in the context that they're being mm. sent to. And they, they're just trying to survive in prison, never mm. mind thinking about, well, what, what mess did I leave behind in my community? It's survival yeah. for the fittest. So if we're wanting to see a change in South Africa and in other nations too, but in you know, in our communities, something there's a lot that needs to change. And you know, it's interesting because I think that in a way, uh, the very presence of uh, just your small team, you know, uh, gives them. I don't know if this is the case, but it gives them the opportunity to see that not everyone is out there to get them. You know, you can have people as well that are not against you, which you don't you don't need to feel defensive. Uh, against all the time yeah. you know some people are there just because they want to uh, give you a hand mm. you know you don't need to defend against them so that's that's a change because I imagine that day to day mm. you know they need to be alert all the time because mm. anyone might do this or that to them yeah. and they have no friends no real friends and then they have the guidance for, for protection all that but sometimes you don't need to have protection against another person it's another human mm. uh, and they, they need to be exposed to that I suppose yeah. You know, a little kindness, if you like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah it's, it's a real privilege and honor to, to work in in the prison and and to do the work we do and to meet these young men and hear their stories. Uh, I feel I walk away with you know so much more. Um, but, and, and and this restorative process, yes. But I, I feel like there's more. There's more that needs to happen than just going in and running a nice program and ticking the boxes for correctional services you know there needs to be more we need to engage with corrections to say for young people can we create and develop um uh revolutionize the the justice system to not just divert yes diversion of course that that's like ultimately that's actually but, my last question you you <laughs> like, I, I was gonna ask you yes. do you have anything else you want to say before yeah. we go into the last question which yeah. is what do you think are the challenges that you're facing in at present and in the near future? And what would you like to see happen uh, through your work and through mm -hmm. changes in legislation, perhaps, and things yeah. like that? Um, I think I've answered that. <laughs> I was ultimate, well, I think to, to see... Greater just... coordination between other, other organizations as well that provide other types of services. Yeah. Um, something like, for example, what uh, is done here in some areas. Uh, I know that in some regions in the UK, because uh, mm -hmm. in here there isn't a national structure. This is done very much uh, through police and crime commissioners areas. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, areas where you have, yes, a restorative justice element, but then you have also another element uh, of people working to solve housing problems, yeah. another one working to solve psychological problems, medical mm -hmm. uh work employment is one of the main ones yeah because uh, uh, you need to give people the opportunity to have independent fulfilling lives to an extent yeah. that a life that uh, perhaps uh, you know uh, after prison and with that burden can be fulfilling but that's the sort of thing mm -hmm. so i suppose that your work uh doesn't quite stop uh when people are released from prison mm -hmm. but really there needs to be something else yeah. when that happens there needs to be uh some of this and I know that some people might think, you know, why, why spend so much effort uh, if people are essentially delinquent? Well, first thing is because they're human, and second thing is because that's a greater good for the society. You know, mm -hmm. if you throw them back and they uh, reoffend, you know, what good has yeah. that prison done to you personally, as perhaps a victim or member of the community? Yeah. None. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, there's hope and. Um, but, but, you know, ultimately I feel to see, I mean, some of the things James and other people would speak about is um, things like, you know, having yoga or contemplative prayer as a, as a main part of, of someone's structure and day. Uh, because, again, that's working on, on their heightened state or they're bringing them to a place where they're ready to receive new information or ready to receive the fact of what what I've done and the mess left behind, but you know, just going in and beginning to talk about that, and and there's many other things one can do to, you know, I mean, I know art and 
you know, creative things. And, and so what, what, what could a, a, a prison look like that, you know, it might look different. The space might be, there may be gardens and there may be animals coming in for therapy. I don't know. I mean, there's so many ways you, we can... You, you sort of uh, talking can, about opening the oyster, you know, that, that is the world. Letting these kids know that there's other things in life than yeah. gang violence or this violence in their environment. Yeah. You know, they can do other things. Yes. Other things that they could be interested in, some other things that are fulfilling yeah. and beautiful. Yeah. I mean, many of them actually are too, if, you know, if we speak about meeting their victims, they, they will be like, no way. It's like, if, if we stole a car and, uh, you know, for example, and then, um, you know, and then we thought, well, we either have to get, meet the victim or we could drop it off at one in the morning and not, not see anyone. We'd much rather drop it off one in the morning and, and not see anyone, you know, the, the, the fact of, 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 you know, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just interesting speaking with them and hearing about, um, and yet when we have brought in, for example, a surrogate victim into our class, um, this, this, this person shared how they got some closure for themselves coming in to share in a context like prison. And I'm sort of going off the you know, direction here now, but it, you know, it's just interesting joining the dots that, um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think it's a powerful thing to, um, to yeah, it's part of their reintegration to, to begin to bring in. I mean, we even use newspaper stories and that, in it, that is enough to begin to unlock some of the, the realization of... In what way do you use them? Well, we, we well, there's plenty of stories in South Africa in the news around crime <laughs> and what goes on. So we, we, we pick quite big stories, but general stories that may not be necessarily specific to their case, but we begin to say, well, we read the story together to them, and then we, we say, well, who's all being impacted by this? And they're just, they're, 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 they might name one or two um, people or from the story, but then when you begin to unpack it, you begin to see the the ripple effects, um, you know, of of the, you know what what has happened, and, and then you begin to see the light bulbs go on. So it's something as simple as news, newspaper stories that, you know, yes, it's, one can bring in surrogate victims, or one can maybe watch videos. We don't always have the the opportunity, access to tools and of the, of that kind in prison. So mm. we we just try and be as creative with what we've got. Um, and we just talk around these things and um, and many of them are, it's interesting when we assess our program at the end um, we, we, we always have a poster each each session we create a poster and so we stick all the posters up on the wall and then we we give them some post sticks and we say okay now put a smiley face and it's really simple just stick it on your favorite class you know just so we can see well what have they enjoyed what haven't they enjoyed and it's fascinating because I would say 80% are drawn to the forgiveness class. That there's such a desperate desire, obviously, for forgiveness, but without understanding the impact or the complexities of it. And that's why we're finding this, um, this DVD really helpful. We actually show it in prison now, and it, the young, we, we engage around that. And, but, but, but what I find fascinating is that they are all drawn to, whether it's self-forgiveness they're struggling with, whether it's desiring their a victim or a survivor to want to forgive them or whether it's you know having needing to forgive someone for the 667 accounts of trauma that have happened to them it's all it's all these complexities but this, this forgiveness topic which i think in restorative justice is a an interesting one that some people like to go to or say you know yes it's not the outcome but for i think for for these young men it's important to them I know it's you know it's not something we push on them or we, um, we re, you know it, it 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 can happen in the process, but it's not a forced outcome, and yet and yet it's important to them, and I think that's really that's important. I think to it's say. very I think it's very interesting uh, because that's not something that I think is going to be specific to South African youth. I think mm. that that's going to be something shared here. I think again, I'm not an expert, but I think that young people. Perhaps feel a stronger need of being accepted by society, and being forgiven, or having that dialogue of forgiveness, yeah. is important because particularly important for younger people. 
you know, as you grow older, you don't. When when you're a teenager, perhaps you 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 try to be part of the group, the group of nice guys over there, or mm. or you know the cool kids over there, whatever it is. You want to be accepted by your family. You want to be accepted by your social group around you. As you grow older, you you don't care so much about that. So that that's why I think that perhaps with younger people, this is a more crucial issue. Yeah. And perhaps that's why forgiveness is uh, is the one uh, class that they are going to. Yeah. To be honest, I think that you have given us quite a few examples of very creative thinking. You know, with the uh, posture of the body where they they can uh, sort of collect. Uh, the harm that they have felt mm. physically and psychologically, and then uh, mm. going through a new story as a way to introduce a, a a subject and have them think about it not at the personal level first, you mm. know. So because if they if mm. they went in at the personal level, yeah. they would think you know I don't want to talk about it, I don't want to criticize this yeah. because that's what I did. I don't yeah. want to be saying here in public you know mm. that's wrong because that's mm. what I did. Mm. But if it's something else, someone mm. else's offense yeah. then you know they feel more free perhaps to, to criticize it yeah. and then uh, the reckoning comes afterwards yeah so uh, those are very interesting creative techniques yeah. and that uh, i want to thank you for sharing them with uh, yeah. with everyone because i think that a lot of people are going to find it useful yeah. uh, when trying to help young people in prison or at risk <laughs> of being in prison yes. i think that we can yes. we can do some work before uh, they they go into prison as well. Yes, definitely. So Lisa, I don't want to take any more of your time. No. I know that you're very busy because uh, obviously you come to London I'm only once. To go back to London. London. That's it. That's a very quick trip. Uh, uh, but I want to thank you for bringing me this, uh, an African pattern tea towel, which uh, I don't know if I will actually use as a tea towel. I might have to have it uh, hung on the wall because it's really very beautiful, oh, and uh, it will bring very good memories. Oh, so yeah. thank you so much. No, thank you. And and just final final point. I know we're saying goodbye now. Is also just to watch the space on the restorative justice team in South Africa. I forgot to mention, Mike Batley and Anne Skelton wrote a book in 2006 called Charting Progress, um, looking at restorative justice in South Africa. And what's very exciting is that they, 10 years down the line now, are really looking at that, which I think is very important for, for us in this field and, you know, in whichever countries we're in, they, 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 they're saying, okay, well, how... How far are we going? And so that's going to be probably published in a few months' time. So so look out for that. Um, Mike Batley from the Restorative Justice Centre. Um, I think it's exciting then to see, well, how far have we come? Have we gone backwards? Have we gone forwards? Have other things grown? Uh, I'm really excited about that. So if you're interested in, you know... Restorative you're going to give me the details and we'll I'll, put them on I'll the forum as well. When, uh, when, they, when they publish it. We'll, um, we'll keep an eye. We'll keep an eye because uh, that could be interesting. We were talking about this before, you know, how... And you need to evaluate things. Mm. Uh, you know, it's very good to to have initiatives and programs and things like that. But you need to evaluate them. Yeah. And I think that uh, that's definitely you know the sort of thing that you need to take stock and look back at what you've done and see what works, what doesn't, and what yeah. can be done. Yeah. So you give me the details. I uh, will, and I've really enjoyed this conversation and just meeting you and everyone. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone.